What you're looking at right now is actually a live look over the Israel-Lebanon border from one of the many cameras that we do have in this area. Now, we talk a lot about Hamas, but the fight does continue between Hezbollah and Israel as well. I want to bring in David Dode, a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, to talk more about Hezbollah. Thank you so much, David, for taking the time to join us here and help break down the latest details. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Of course. Well, before we get into it here, I do actually want to get your take on Hezbollah in general. We use mm -hmm. the term a lot. We've heard a lot about it. We know it's connected to Lebanon. But for folks who are only getting those bits and pieces, can you explain what Hezbollah mm -hmm. is? Mm -hmm. Well, um, let me use Hezbollah's own words. Let's go back to its 1985 open letter. This is its foundational document. Um, they, they, they've said that this remains kind of the, the document that governs their identity, their, their politics, their, uh, their ideology. In that document, Hezbollah described itself as the extension uh, of the uh, Islamic revolution that happened in Iran. So this means to us that they are an extension of Iran the same way my arm is an extension of me, I like to say. Um, they, they are ideologically loyal to the Iranian regime. This isn't a matter of material benefit. So, for example, if Iran's uh, assistance to Hezbollah were somehow cut off or reduced, uh, you wouldn't necessarily see Hezbollah uh, turn against Iran. It might actually find ways to help the mothership, as it were. Um, so that is the identity of Hezbollah. It is an extension of the Islamic Republic of Iran that exists within Lebanon. Um, it, it has to take into consideration, as a, re as, as a result of that latter factor, its existence in Lebanon, domestic Lebanese conditions. Uh, you know, if you live inside of a house, you want to make sure the roof isn't leaking. You want to make sure the, you know, the, the pipes are taken care of. You want to make sure it's running efficiently, not necessarily because you care about the house primarily, uh, but because your objective is to grow, to prosper. That is Hezbollah's primary objective in Lebanon. But the policies, the ideology, the worldview that it is pushing, um, its ultimate loyalty is to the Islamic Republic of Iran. And I want to get your take after Arab media reports that Iran has given Hezbollah the quote unquote green light to escalate attacks on Israel's mm -hmm. northern border. What mm -hmm. exactly would an escalation look like? Are we talking mm -hmm. about a full fledged all out war between the two sides? Um, it remains unclear. Look, uh, one thing I've tried to stress is that since October 8th, when Hezbollah began its unprovoked attacks against Israel, there has been a war. Uh, wars come in different formats, right? This is a, uh, a low, low intensity war of attrition, uh, but with over 1,000 individual attacks carried out by Hezbollah against Israel since October 8th. This was as of earlier this month, so we can say maybe 1,500 attacks, give or take now. Um, this is a war. Uh, what would a full blown, uh, no holds barred war look like? Um, it would look nightmarish. Uh, Hezbollah has spent uh, the past 18 years uh, expanding its arsenal. Uh, to a point where it has 150,000 projectiles. If we focus just on the short-range projectiles, and that's not even the most lethal component um, of, of, its, uh, of its arsenal, but it forms the bulk of its, of its missile arsenal, um, it has maybe somewhere up, upwards of 80,000 of those projectiles, give or take. Now, Israeli estimates say that Hezbollah, at least in the early phases of the war, lower estimates I've heard said could fire 1,500 rockets, higher estimates up to 3,000 to 4,000 rockets into Israel on a daily basis. So this dwarfs uh, the, the number of rockets that were fired in the second Lebanon war in 2006, which 100, you know, 100 rockets on average, I think the total was about 4,000 rockets. So in one day, they can fire everything they fired in, in 34 days. Israel's capability to withstand that uh, through the Iron Dome, uh, it, it, it can't. Right. In terms of the sheer number of those rockets, uh, Iron Dome stocks will run out very quickly. Um, and from a financial perspective, each one of those Hezbollah rockets costs about $150. Uh, each Tamir interceptor that the Iron Dome fires um, is about forty dollars to $50,000 at the lower end. So you do the math on whether that's economically feasible for Israel. At the end of the day, what the Israelis are going to have to do is to judiciously choose uh, which targets they're going to have to allow to be struck on, on the Israeli side. Um, because they're, they're not going to have enough interceptors and missile defense systems to cover all of Israel. What this means from the Israeli side is that you know, they can't fight this war in a defensive manner. Um, the Air Force, as we saw in 2006, was not able to silence the short-term or the short-range missile threat uh, because they're very mobile. They move around very quickly. Um, so Israel's going to have to launch a massive ground invasion uh, immediately 
uh, an overwhelming ground invasion in order to stop this this short range missile threat. Um, that's just from that, right? And, and and that puts us in a scenario where Israel is going to experience uh, unprecedented destruction, uh, displacement of population. Uh, it's hard to estimate the, the the casualty rate on the Israeli side from these you know. 1,500 to 4,000 rockets a day because they're imprecise, but we can assume it'll be very high. And on the Lebanese side as well, the intensity of the Israeli counter operation in order to cease these, just to stop these rockets is also going to have to be very intense. The intertwining of Hezbollah's assets with military, uh, with civilian assets is also going to, uh, as we're seeing, by the way, in Gaza, is going to incur a cost for the civilian population and, and Lebanon civilian infrastructure as well. How does Hezbollah compare to Hamas? Is there a relationship between the two? It sounds like, from what we're discussing here, that Hezbollah is significantly stronger than Hamas overall. Absolutely. Um, Hezbollah is Hamas on, 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 you know, uh, on steroids. Uh, what I just described, the nightmare scenario, was a portion of its arsenal. If we look at the totality of its arsenal, which includes long-range missiles, potential precision-guided missiles that can reach as far as Tel Aviv, they've said as far as Eilat, uh, right? there's no reason not to believe that they have, maybe not in the same quantities of these short-range missiles, but if you have 14,000 Zilzal missiles, for example, which can reach Tel Aviv, uh, they're not precision-guided missiles, but you fire a barrage of 1,000 at them at the same time, you're going to do a lot of damage. Hamas doesn't have those capabilities yet. Um, Hamas doesn't have the training, the expertise that Hezbollah has. The relationship between them um, actually demonstrates the Hezbollah's increased lethality over Hamas. Um, Hezbollah essentially trained Hamas right, to, to, to come to its, uh, it, its current fighting level. Um, the relationship goes back to the early 1990s uh, when the Israelis had expelled uh, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad operatives to South Lebanon. Um, when, when the Israelis had occupied that area. Uh, Hezbollah took them in. Uh, they trained them. They gave them war fighting expertise. Then the Israelis were pressured by the international community to take these operatives, these Palestinian operatives, back uh, into the Palestinian territories. Uh, and that created the link between Hamas uh, and, and Hezbollah. Since then, they've exploited it during the Second Intifada uh, to, to pass on assistance to Palestinian militant groups, uh, if you remember the Korean A incident, uh, a shipment of weapons that originated from the Iranians, but that Hezbollah facilitated, uh, that was supposed to go to Fatah. Uh, Hezbollah was involved in that. Uh, there were reports um, from 1998 that Hezbollah had started to train Palestinian militant groups uh, two years prior to the Intifada to fight the Intifada. Uh, if we go into more recent times, right, if we recall in uh, May of 2021, uh, there was a conflagration uh, within Israel between uh, Jews and Arabs. Uh, and in addition to the war that was going on between uh, Israel and Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad group in Gaza, after that, uh, Hezbollah's uh, deputy secretary general said, hey, this is a strategic game changer for us. This is a strategic opportunity. Since then, Israeli police have noted an uptick in weapons uh, so, uh, being shipped from Lebanon into the Palestinian territories, particularly the West Bank. And we've seen in that time period also a resurgence of groups like Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and offshoots within the West Bank. We've seen the rise of new groups like the Lions Den, which isn't directly connected, but also being in some ways supported by, by, by Hezbollah and the, uh, the Islamic Republic. So Hezbollah acts as the supplier and trainer to a large degree of Hamas uh, and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. And in that role, as kind of the, the, the older brother in the resistance act, we can also determine that it's a far more lethal actor. Something that's interesting is we do talk a lot about Hamas, but do you think enough attention is being paid to Hezbollah and the threat that it does pose? I think currently now uh, it's not um, because for obvious reasons, we have a war uh, that's going on in, in Gaza. There's a humanitarian tragedy that's going on there as a as a consequence of that war, as a natural consequence of that war. Um, and all the international focus is on that. Uh, meanwhile, the Lebanon border, while it has the potential uh, to be much more destructive, uh, is, is relatively, and I stress the term relatively quieter, because as I mentioned earlier, I, I would argue that a war is going on in the North, uh, but it, it, it isn't as pressing um, as, as what's going on with, with, with Hamas and Gaza. Um, the images that are coming out aren't as, as gripping and harrowing as what's going on with Gaza. Um, so the focus on the threat of Hezbollah is naturally reduced. 
as are the uh, the proposals now to, to solve the the issue on the northern border. Right? We've seen French proposals uh, because of this. I don't want to call it an underestimation, but maybe because it's not viewed as an, an immediate of a threat. Uh, we've had French proposals backed, possibly according to reports by the United States, that would only distance Hezbollah 10 kilometers. Uh, from from the blue line, right, the de facto uh, border that exists between Lebanon and Israel. Now, uh, this is this is uh, far below the minimal requirement that Resolution 1701 requires, which is to distance Hezbollah at least 40 kilometers uh, from the border north of the Litani River, or to disarm Hezbollah. Right, that resolution recognized the threat that Hezbollah posed to regional stability and security, and so it required at least a minimum distancing and a disarmament. That's not that's not happening. Um, and the proposals themselves now do not contain a credible mechanism to prevent Hezbollah's return. We hear buttressing uh, Lebanese armed forces uh, numbers in the south as if that's going to solve the problem. But let me quote, not me, but Lebanese Foreign Minister Abdullah Habib very recently, uh, January 17th, where he said, to disarm Hezbollah, to try to rein in Hezbollah unilaterally through the state uh, would result in a civil war. To leave Hezbollah to its own devices would result in a regional war. And if he were given the choice, uh, he would choose a regional war over a civil war every time. So this is the Lebanese calculus, that any price that they will have to pay for Hezbollah's adventurism is going to be lower than the price that they would have to pay for reigning in Hezbollah. So there is no credible mechanism to prevent Hezbollah's return, even from this 10-kilometer area that they were, they were they're trying to be pushed from, or to rein it in in the long run. This just means that Hezbollah is going to continue to grow and the threat that it poses is going to continue to grow. All right, David, a lot of great information there about uh, Hezbollah. We appreciate you taking the time to join us here. Anything else you want to add about any of this before I let you go? Um, no, thank you for having me on. I would just say keep watching the northern border. Uh, it, is a, it is a critical component of the war that's going on. Um, and it, it is one that is far less predictable in its outcome than what's going on in Gaza. All right. Thank you again for taking the time to be here with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right, everybody, I do want to take you out to this uh, tweet. This is actually a, a post on Twitter from President Biden, as he did say in the coming days, the United States will carry out airdrops of aid in Gaza, redouble our efforts to open a maritime corridor and expand deliveries by land. The aid flowing into Gaza is nowhere near enough. We all need to do more and the United States will do more. We are starting to get reports that the first humanitarian aid has dropped. There been airdropped by the U.S. in Gaza. We are waiting for more information and images to come out of there. Once we get those, we'll pass those along to you at home on Live Now from Fox.